Oh my god. Yep. I've got an opportunity to catch up with Michael Morkov, but I wonder if you could uh, start the interview by telling me how to say your name correctly, because my Danish is non-existent, and I've heard all sorts of iterations of how to say your surname. Could we get it correct, please? Actually, I have to say that uh, one of the few commentators in the world, outside of the Danish, of course, who, who actually pronounce it quite close is uh, Robbie McEwen, and I'm, I'm wondering if he, he practices a bit on it, but he's, he's pretty close. So my name is Merkel. But actually, like when you say uh, in Danish Mikael Merkel, uh, when you in English say Michael, it, I think it's suit suitable more to say uh, Morkov. So I would say my English name is Michael Morkov and in, in Danish is uh, Mikael Merkel. Mikael Merkel. Okay. Well, kudos to Robbie and to Matt Keenan for getting it correct. You, we know you as the... The Danish national champion, you seem to have that year on year, one after the other. <laughs> we also know you as a, a lead out specialist and also someone with a huge uh, passion for track racing. My introduction to you came the year when you were on the attack every single day in the Tour de France and I think that year you won the Super Combative, is that correct? Uh, I had a Super Combative uh, two days doing that tour um, and I was kind of getting told on the last week that I would be the one who would get the Super Competitive prize. Uh, but in the very end, uh, the, the two organizations decided to give it to my teammate uh, Chris Anker Sorensen instead, because he, he also been in some extraordinary breakaways and they kind of went to me and said, look, we give it to, to Chris, but you should see it as a, a prize for you and your team as well. So yeah, he got it, but uh, I was very competitive in that Tour de France, that's sure was 2012. Okay. That was my debut in the, in the Tour de France and uh, I was quite lucky uh, to, you can say lucky, I got into uh, a Tour de France team without a, a designated uh, leader. Um, so we was there uh, shooting on, on everything. That was the words of, of Bjarne coming into the Tour. He said, look in this Tour we're gonna, we're gonna go for everything. Breakaways, points, mountain jersey, whatever, just, just have fun. And me, as a debut in the, in the tour, I, I managed to hit the breakaway on the first day and, and sprint m myself into the mountain jersey. And then you, you didn't stop there, you continued uh, attacking throughout the tour, didn't you? Yeah, basically the first three stages I was in the breakaway every day, uh, collecting the few points that I could uh, take for, for the mountain jersey. It was up north France or in Belgium, so, so the climbs was like, in my range, like not longer than one kilometer. Mm -hmm. So uh, I could manage it with my sprint and I hold on to that uh, mountain jersey for six days until we re re reach the real mountains. Uh, cycling is a lot bigger than the Tour and uh, I guess one of the more neglected disciplines or uh, more neglected aspects of the professional cycling is track racing. And I know you have an enthusiasm for the Madison the points race, I assume? Yeah, sure. Uh, so where does that lead you as you look towards Tokyo later this year? Uh, are you vying for a place on the track? Yeah, definitely. I'm really targeting the, the Tokyo Olympic Games really hard, uh, especially after the Olympic, uh, especially after the Madison came back in the Olympic program. So I did the Madison uh, in 2008 in Beijing, uh, did a sixth place. And after those Olympics, they, they took the medicine out of the program. So for 12 and 16, it wasn't there. And now it's back for 20. I see it as my last call uh, concerning my age. And um, I'm, I'm feeling really lucky that I get the opportunity to, to, to target uh, Tokyo. And also <clears throat> having a, a very good partner in Lesser Norman Hansen, we, we're going to be a, a quite competitive team for both World Championships and Olympics this year. I have to remember my uh, Olympic history, but he's the gold medalist from the Omnium in London, is that right? Yeah, so Lasse, he won the Olympic gold medal in Omnium in the age of 20, when he, that was his breakthrough. So, um, And in the last Olympics in Rio, he had two bronze, one in, uh, in Omnium and one in Teams Pursuit. So um, he, uh, he's one of the guys on the track who probably won the most medals. And you know already it'll be the true of you doing the Madison, is that right? 
So it's not uh, it's not fixed yet, but it it seems like it could be turning out that way. So me and Lassie together uh, recently became a European champion in the medicine, and we won uh, the last uh, World Cup we did together. Um, so we we're gonna do the Worlds together, and and hopefully also the Olympics. If we look at the World Cup examples in recent times, we can see a phenomenal Denmark in the Team Pursuit. And that's, the Team Pursuit is a, a, a little pet project of mine. I've followed it closely since 1984. You've written a number of Team Pursuits over the years, I'm sure, but can you imagine riding a 348? Yeah, I can imagine that. Uh, I mean, on the last camps I was training with the team. Uh, Maybe not being the strongest kind of team, but definitely uh, being a, among the, the, the four or five uh, stronger guys. So then our team went to the World Cups and did 48, 49, close to world record. So uh, I would see myself uh, possible joining the team during the same time. I've known Heiko Salzweil for many years. I know that he came into the Danish uh, infrastructure for a little while. He's been able to make pursuit teams fast, but what's happening at the moment? Because from my recollection of the very fast team pursuits recently, it was always the same four guys from Denmark. Is that correct? Yeah, it was. Yeah. And you know, none of them have any uh, big history on the road. Where did they come from and what's going to happen? And do you, and do you expect that that could be Denmark versus? someone in the final? Yeah, absolutely. I think our team is going for both the World Championships gold and also Olympic goals with the times that they're doing now. And I have to say also that, of course, you have some other examples like in, in Jaron Thomas and Bradley Wiggins and these guys, but in, in as I see it, the most team pursuiters, they come from national teams, not being really famous names, but having a young age, being extremely powerful and, 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 and strong. and kind of grow up on, on the track Team Pursuit team, like I did myself uh, on the Heiko Salzfedel, and afterwards becoming a road professional. So you, you worked with Heiko? Yeah, I worked with him for four years. Okay. So like basically we didn't have a track team in Denmark uh, back in 2005 when he joined us. Mm. Uh, and the Federation set up this Olympic uh, program uh, with him as a coach. Uh, I was one of the five riders involved in that and I worked very closely with him, uh, traveling the world around uh, with him and his program and we finished off with uh, winning the Olympic silver medal in Beijing. And then eventually you get into the Saxo Bank fold and you talked about Bjarne early, he's just coming back to the sport now. You're Danish, he's Danish, you would have grown up watching him race a bike and so on. What are your feelings about Bjarne Ries? I wonder if we could just start with a general overview of him as a person. Yeah, so he was the guy who, who signed me first. After Olympic silver in, in Beijing, uh, he, he signed me a contract for the following year with, uh, with Saxo. And at that, at that time I was 24 years old, so it was very good time for me to, to get into the road program. I wasn't that promising talent compared to many other guys but Bjarne he, he saw the talent in me and, and he supported me and I kept renewing contract with him as well and yeah it was some very good years with a Danish team the Saxo Bank team and he's a extremely yeah well organized uh, good manager like everybody know and um, yeah it's been kind of sad that he was out of the sport or at least world tour level the last couple of years but I'm very happy that he, he got the chance to get back in and I also spoke with him the other day and I can see that he has now a really huge motivation so maybe it wasn't so bad for him to be out for a few years and now coming back with a, with a big um, motivation to to do what he do best. He had some press uh, interviews to do yesterday <coughs> afternoon or this time yesterday and ob the obvious questions come up and I, I, when you say the name Bjarne Ries to someone in cycling there's a, you can almost see the response that people have, but you clearly see him as a, as a, you don't see the tainted history, you see the involvement that you've had with him. Is that a fair way of saying it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, like I, I grew up with him like uh, as one of the major pro cyclists and basically him winning the Tour de France in 96 
um, was what started my inspiration of cycling. I was looking a bit more to the track at that point and I was also very inspired of Olaf Sørensen who was a classic specialist but, but in Bjarne was definitely one of the guys who really inspired a lot of young kids including myself back in the days and I started cycling because of one of his likes and then afterwards uh, getting the chance to ride in his uh, famous uh, team which he had on the CSC Saxobank team was one of the best team at, uh, for some years. Um, yeah, that was some some really uh, proud memories I have with him. I'm going to just shift the track away for a little while and we'll talk maybe about Piano if we have to again, but it's not what we are here for in yeah. 2020. Mm -hmm. I want to try and understand the motivation for someone like you or Roger Kluger or the the guys who are doing this job that you have where and you do it with precision and um, considering the, the chaos you do it with remarkable regularity how 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 is that possible that you can always get to where you need to be at that time and have the acceleration and do everything the way that you have with a series of captains that you've had with uh, now the Kony Quickstep yeah, it's a hard question to answer really because I have to say that just five or maybe seven years ago when I tried to, to get involved in the bunch sprint myself or as a lead out or trying to help other teammates, I would think it was a big mess. I couldn't find my way in it and I was just drifting back uh, after the race, couldn't tell why. I didn't succeed with getting in the front and you would watch the videos and you would say how can the same guys keep on being there at the front being precise, deliver their teammates. Can and you give me an example who you were watching in the videos? Uh, not Who's not exactly, but just, uh, a good a good example would be like Mark Renshaw. He was uh, at at his time, like years ago, not so many years ago, but a few years ago, he was the the best uh, lead out man in the world. On had amazing relationship uh, with with Cavendish, and I think that's probably the couple. Uh, in recent times who, who won the most together so like he he was definitely a, a guy to to watch out for and and i was just sometimes sitting there and and thinking like how how can he be so precise and and hit it every single time when i was feeling it was such a chaos and and now the last couple of years i'm just kind of still sometimes uh, wondering how i managed to do it but i i think it's just a matter of having a lot of experience uh, having a big confidence and yeah now it just seems like it actually seems so it, it feels so easy for me to be there i'm not even in doubt before the stage if i would be there or not uh, that i would have been five or seven years ago but now i know i will be there i will do my job and i can even go into really fine details of what i want to do in the sprint uh, for my sprinter can you give us an example of the fine details that you consider yeah, but I have a lot of uh, fine details and tactics coming into a sprint can be like uh, to select uh, which uh, side of the road you want to go at, to maybe um, uh, interact that other teams would start their sprint earlier than they normally would have done. Um, yeah, maybe like I feel like sometimes can I try to create uh, the best possible scenario for me and my team. Can we um, talk about some of the, the, the sprinters that you've worked with? And uh, I don't know if you want to go in reverse order. We start with Sam Bennett, for example, and then uh, consider Elia, Elia Viviani, and then before that, Gaviria. You, you were still quick step then, weren't you? With Gaviria? Yes. Yeah, but I, I never raced so much with him because uh, I was with now with quick step the last two years. Yes. Uh, I joined the team together with Elia, okay. and, and I was pretty much with him all the time. I did a few races with the. Uh, Gaviria, but never uh, deli delivered him for a win. Okay, so co can we just talk maybe about the, the nuance of different sprinters that you have worked with uh, now that you have found your way as the lead out specialist? Who, who do you enjoy working with the most and, uh, and why maybe? Could you give some anecdotes along those lines? Yeah, so like in the last couple of years I, I worked with with quite a lot of very talented sprinters. So recently I'm, I'm now working with, with Sam 
um, <clears throat> which turned out to be one of the very best sprinters last season before joining us. And uh, I, I don't know him really well. We just had a, a few training camps together and now we are, we are joined here together in, in Down Under. But it still takes some time, some weeks, some, some races before you really got you get under the skin of each other and start to know each other really well. But so far, uh, I think we had a fantastic start winning the first stage here down under and also like seems like we have uh, pretty much the same way to, to, to see the sprints coming in. So that's, that's working fine. But turning the years back, uh, obviously I had a very good relationship with, with Elia the last two years we won. I think I, think I almost delivered him uh, for, for 10 victories uh, last year and 10 the year before. So we, we joy, enjoyed a lot of victories together. And on top of that, uh, in the meantime, uh, in my spare time, <laughs> <laughs> I, I brought also uh, Fabio Jakobsen a few times mm -hmm. to victories and also Alvaro Hodek, so um, very talented sprinters. And, and before my time with Quickstep, I was uh, riding with, uh, with Christoph in, in, in Katusha, which is a, a close friend of mine. And I had also the pleasure to to lead him out and uh, yeah before that I was uh, doing a few races with Sagan back in the tink of days and that's really where I start to find my path uh, as a lead out. Each of these guys that you've referenced the, the, the become huge superstars and largely as a result of your work. And do you sort of have an uh, aspiration, you've, if you've worked with Peter Sagan, you've seen the um, pandemonium he creates when he goes anywhere. Would you like that kind of attention yourself? Uh, actually not. Uh, sometimes I'm wondering how it must be to be Peter Sagan or Julian Alaphilippe or the really biggest star in, in the world of cycling because uh, like when I'm in Denmark, I'm a bit of a star myself and sometimes I'm having a lot of attention around me, like signing autograph when I'm at a track race, especially at the six days of Copenhagen, there's a lot of tension, like media and tension. But I feel it's just must be kind of one or two percent of what a guy like Sagan or uh, Ella Philippe is experienced. So yeah, it's really uh, beyond my imagination uh, what pressure these guys is going through. And uh, sometimes I'm delighted that I can fall a little bit back in the shadows and 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 do my work uh, and and do what I like. You live still in Denmark. Yeah, uh, now I live in Denmark. I I, did, I live with my wife and my two kids uh, in Copenhagen the last uh, five years. Uh, before that, we was living seven years in Lucca in Italy. Um, but now we're based in Copenhagen and we're really uh, happy to be here. Can we talk a little bit about the culture of Denmark? The Tour de France has a grand départ there next year. Yeah. It's uh, got a huge heritage for cycling. It sounds as though it's the place to ride a bike for the everyday person, not, the, not necessarily pro cyclist. Uh, what is it about cycling in Denmark that is so compatible? Yeah, we have a huge uh, cycling culture in Denmark. Um, Maybe a lot. I still believe a lot of it comes from the victory of Bjarne Ries back in '96 at the Tour de France. Uh, that's really uh, yeah, remarkable for Denmark uh, that he is the only Dane ever uh, won a Tour de France. Uh, but also, like we have an, I think we have an inspiring country for for riding the bike, uh, like many other countries have, like good roads for it. And it's also just yeah, really modern uh, kind of business. Um, a business model uh, to do these uh, social rides uh, like you see everywhere now also a lot here in Australia I see that uh, but it's just like most guys have a bike uh, also if we don't talk, talk about race bike I would say in Denmark that 99% of all people will have an actual bike so I don't think that's a case in many other countries but it's like uh, when you are on the age of three four five years you will get your first bike and you will normally have a, a bike that is yours the rest of your life. So it's just, just a culture. It's a little like in Australia where in summer you get a cricket bat as a child or in winter you get a, a football and in Denmark you get a bicycle. And, and then because you can relate to it, then watching the sport becomes 
more entertaining because you can appreciate the effort more and then it just snowballs, doesn't it? It just gets better. Yeah, I think so. And it, it's not about when you get a bike in Denmark, it's not about becoming a cyclist or as a sport, but it's more like a transportation possibility. Mm -hmm. And and if you watching, if you stay close to the schools in Denmark, you would see that mostly all kids in when they are above eight or nine years, they will ride their bike to school on their own. So all kids will arrive at the school alone on bike. And, and therefore, like uh, there will not be any school uh, kids not having a bike in Denmark. So you grow up on a bike uh, and obviously it's not so hard to imagine that if you like riding the bike to school and you watch a bike race that you want to feel like one of the stars once in a while. Based on your experiences in the cycling world, but as a, as a Danish person who's observed the growth of cycling, how do you think that uh, other countries could enhance their participation in cycling? What was the, is the one catalyst that could really tip it, make that social change that's required? I think it's a hard uh, question for me to answer. It's not that I'm spending a lot of time on how uh, the whole world should get on bikes. And it's also not that I want to put Denmark on the top of a list of how to ride a bike. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, the bikes just getting in more and more popular and and also when you see around the world, uh, there's getting more and more uh, well-equipped uh, hobby cyclists around, like with very good bikes, very good equipment, like having it uh, almost like a lifestyle. You're 34 now, yes. yeah, which means you're sort of coming towards the end of your career, but uh, it doesn't seem to be slowing down at all. Are you thinking about the next step at the moment, or are you still just focusing on the lead out? At the moment, I'm just focusing on the lead out and my job in a team, and I'm really enjoying to be a part of this team, feeling really lucky. Um, also, I'm feeling really lucky that I kind of develop myself uh, in this quite old age I would say and uh, and also very lucky now to have uh, Olympics coming up this year and next year having the possibility to start uh, the Tour de France, in, uh, Tour de France in, in Denmark so I have some very nice clear gold just in front of me um, which make my uh, yeah my life easier in this age instead of being um, almost about to pack my suitcase and, and leaving the world of cycling. I'm, I'm very hungry on, on certain goals and uh, yeah, for the moment uh, I can't see uh, when I should stop cycling. I wish you all the best for this season. I'm going to pay attention to the Madison uh, with great interest. I think that uh, maybe with uh, the help of people like you, can we can start uh, showing the world what a beautiful thing track racing is. That would be great, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having a chat. Okay, thank you.